I'm reading from the New Testament, John chapter 18, verses 36 and 37. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Our Old Testament scripture lesson comes from the book of Daniel in the third chapter. Listen now to God's word for us. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, to fall down and worship the statue that I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward. Oops, we already said that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men? That we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not consumed. The, uh, the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their tunics were not harmed. And not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That is a pretty rough way to get a promotion at work. Well, here we are. We're moving right along. We started back in Genesis with creation and Abraham. We follow the people all the way to their exile in Babylon, hearing the prophecies of Jeremiah last week, this week. We move to Daniel. It's an interesting book because Daniel's actually written in both Hebrew and Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke. It's a common language of the people at the time. You see, we've been moving chronologically in historical order of the story of Israel. But this one kind of cheats. This part of Daniel is about the time of 587 B.C., the destruction of the temple looming in the background, the people exiled by King Nebuchadnezzar, but it was actually written about 400 years later when the Greeks were the ones threatening to destroy traditional worship in Jerusalem. There was a war over the temple, and this is the time that these stories and prophecies surface when once again the Hebrew people find themselves under threat with their altar destroyed and their safety, anything but sure. The book of Daniel is telling a story from a long time ago in order to make a point in the present. That's what we do every week. So we're on the same page. Here we go. First things first, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not their real names. You might think I'm going to make a joke about the VeggieTales uh, version of this, which is Rack, Shack, and Benny. It's a pretty good movie. Uh, but no, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the names that are given to them. Their real names are Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. They were renamed, and it was not by choice. It was a power play by their captors. Because their names were important, personally, but also as an expression of faith. God is gracious is the name Hananiah. Who is like God? In the case of Mishael, and God keeps him. In the case of Azariah. These references to the God of Israel have now been substituted with references to the Babylonian gods, such as Nego. Abednego means servant of Nego. It's a move by people in power to demean and diminish those who were not. So it's no surprise that when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego begin to actually succeed in their new home, they begin being elevated in government that others want to see them knock down a peg. So these folks go to King Nebuchadnezzar and say, these guys need to change their religion. They need to serve you and pray to you. Nebuchadnezzar calls them before him to give him homage, and threatens them to bow down before the golden statue of the emperor. They don't. And the way they say it is great. King, we actually aren't going to defend ourselves. Our God is greater than yours. So 
we're just going to go with God on this. But thanks. You see, it's actually, as it's written, supposed to be funny, actually. Throughout Daniel, there are these little dashes of humor. If you have to either laugh or cry at the situation, choose laugh. It's more fun. Now, did you notice the dimensions of the statue? It's like 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. That's a joke for the Bible. It's a pole. You see, their almost snarky response to Nebuchadnezzar is supposed to be that way. In response to threats of fiery death, these guys are pretty nonchalant about it. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this manner. And this is the best part. He says, if our God can save us, great. Then he says, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you've set up. Be it known to you, O king, is essentially 2,000 year old, just so you know, which is not usually the way you address a king. So the king gets angry, really angry. Angry enough to crank on the furnace temp, make it super hot, hotter than it's ever been. And our three musketeers head right in. i got to admire their confidence. Can't you just imagine one of them sticking their head out and asking the king if he could get them graham crackers and marshmallows? Nebuchadnezzar goes nuts, of course, because if there's anything an oppressive force hates, it's being shown to be wrong. And he is. He loses. They go in the fire. But they're not burned. What's more, there's another figure with them. Nebuchadnezzar gives up. He gets them out. And then actually decrees any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. Their houses laid in ruins. There's no other God who is able to deliver this way. So three young men brought out of their country to a foreign land, stripped of their names and their heritage, stand up to a king, speak for their faith, Go into the furnace smiling and come out the same. And even the king praises God. That is one colorful children's story. But it's more than that. Because stories from a long time ago with a message for now, right? This is a story about nonviolent resistance to the powers that oppress, about the ultimate triumph of righteousness over injustice, and about how God is present in the midst of the flames when the people of God are standing amid all that rages about them, bent on destruction. There's no getting around it. People have known that about this passage for a long time. I don't know uh, if you caught it or, or not, but I, I heard on the radio, this week is the 62nd anniversary of the day that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And this I didn't know either. That was December 1st. December 5th, four days later, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was elected by the Montgomery Improvement Association as president of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. That was the first public step in King's work towards civil rights. The first step, four days after a woman said, no, the system isn't right, and I'm done pretending it is. Later, on April 16, 1963, King wrote a letter from a jail in Birmingham, Alabama. Of course, it's famous now, the letter from Birmingham jail. Two things. Uh, First, do you know who the letter is addressed to? Other pastors. Christians. Let's not pretend this message isn't for us in particular. 
that as Christians, it's an imperative to speak for those whose voices go unheard in our communities. It's not optional. And second, you know what, among other things, he cites in this letter? Listen. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. Just in case we started to think that the prophets of the Old Testament weren't relevant to us today. So where's your fire? If you can't feel the heat, you probably aren't being as faithful as you could be. Where's the place where you're growing a little uncomfortable because there's a furnace someone else is getting in? Are you willing to jump in, to stand, to comfort, to declare like the, the first Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other? Because that fire's there. Being a Christian can cost you. It should cost you. Doing the right thing can be hard Staking a claim to what is good can put you in a very awkward position. So bad news and good news. God does not spare you from the fire. But God is with you in the fire. God is with you. Here we are in Advent. We're looking to connect this story from long ago and a land far away to us. In any season of life, we can talk of faithfulness in the midst of trouble. But today, we lit the candle of hope. We light a candle, and we remember the fire of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the candle of hope. In the time of the prophets, it was said the people were walking in darkness. There was a need for hope in abundance, and not much hope was to be had. But with the advent of Christ, they saw a great light. The Messiah, the Deliverer, hope made real. Because when it comes down to it, Christmas is about God coming down to be with us, to dwell among us, to be our hope, to stand with us. So perhaps this story is an Advent story after all. In the fiery furnace... There were four figures, weren't there? Who was the last one? I can just imagine those three guys climb out of the furnace and Nebuchadnezzar demands, who was that? And the answer comes just as nonchalant as before. Yeah, that was God. God with us. In Aramaic, In Greek, in Hebrew, and in English, that's the same word. God with us. Emmanuel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.